Find other great podcasts like this one at podmoth.network. Hello, and welcome to Crime and Spirits, your new favorite true crime and cocktail podcast. I'm your host, Bree. And I'm your other host, Suze. We're best friends who are obsessed with true crime, and we love a good themed cocktail. So we took our two favorite things and turned them into a podcast. I'm the resident bartender here at Crime and Spirits, so every time we get together, I mix up a drink that ties into the episode in some way, shape, or form, and then I teach you how to make one for yourself. That way, you can sip right along with us. We like to keep things conversational around here, so expect some tangents on occasion, as well as some cursing here and there. Think of us as a cross between Dateline and Girls' Night. So, come hang out with us every week while we learn a little something new together. We'd love to chat with you about whatever, really, but mostly true crime. You better buckle up, Buttercup. And sip tight. Let's get on with the show. Woo! Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to Crime and Spirits. As always, we are your hostesses with the mostesses. My name is Bree. And I'm Suze. Thank you guys so much for coming to hang out. You know we love it when you do that. This is the best part of the week. It's the very best part of the week. And I'm so happy to be here. And we're going to just jump right in today because we're excited to get into the nitty gritty of our story. This is one of those stories you think you know till you find out you don't know. No idea. (laughs) Right, exactly. So in case you have no idea what we're talking about, today is the second installment of our deep dive into the infamous criminal couple, Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow. So we spent last week's episode setting the scene, introducing you to who Bonnie and Clyde were as individuals. Just in case you missed the last one, here's the cliff notes for you. Bonnie and Clyde were both born in poverty-stricken families in the early 1900s. They met in Texas in 1930 and formed both a romantic and criminal partnership. Right around this time, Clyde formed the Barrow Gang. This group went on to commit an assortment of crimes over several different states. At the tail end of last week, we introduced you to the initial crew. Today, our focus is going to be on the specifics of the incidents that unfolded during those two years of the gang's activity. Just like last week, we've got a very similar warning. This story is heavy on the gun violence. Since today we are going through the rap sheet of the Barrel Gang completely, basically, the discussion of violence will be a bit more prevalent than last time. We completely get it if this kind of story isn't your jam. No worries at all. We'll catch it on the flip side. We know that the topics covered here are incredibly sensitive in nature and not for every listener. You should always use discretion when choosing what podcasts to listen to, especially ones like ours. Absolutely. We are definitely a podcast geared towards adults. And we always encourage you guys to consume responsibly, no matter what that looks like for you. You know, for example, are you driving to work? Cool. Just make sure you're still paying attention to the road while we make you laugh. Perhaps you're sitting at home, cozied up with a cocktail, sipping along with us while we tell you about some crazy shit. Even better, just make sure you stay home. Whether it's our podcast, alcohol, or any combination of the two, just be smart about it, guys. Safety first. Absolutely, and always. We just want everybody to have a good time. We're just here to hang out, learn some shit. And with all that being said, let's talk about some cocktails. All right, so... Last week, we discussed how Bonnie and Clyde's lawlessness overlapped a little bit with Prohibition. This week, we're rolling the clock back just a little bit farther and mixing up a cocktail called the Sidecar. This cocktail evolved from the original Sour formula, much like the original Daiquiri. Sours are mixed drinks containing a base liquor, lemon or lime juice, and a sweetener, like just as an example I'm putting out there, simple syrup. (laughs) Although the actual origin of this cocktail is a tiny bit murky, it was thought to have been invented around the end of World War I in either London or Paris. The drink was originally named after the motorcycle attachment, a.k.a. the sidecar. You know the one. The little one that rides along, it's got like two tiny tires and your butt sits on the ground. Seems absolutely horrifying to ride in one. I would Mm -hmm. not want to ride in one, but they used them a lot back then. I'm good. Good on that. So I get why they would name it after that. Mm -hmm. At any rate, the Ritz Hotel in Paris claims origin of the drink. The first recipes for the sidecar appear in 1922 in Harry Maclone's Harry's ABC of Mixing Cocktails. In early editions, he credits a bartender at Buck's Club in London, but later on, as seems to be the trend, he credits (laughs) himself as the inventor. And it's also featured in Robert Vermeer's Cocktails and How to Mix Them. 
in which he says that the drink was, quote, very popular in France, end quote. Take that for what it is, however you want to. <laughs> it is also one of six basic drinks listed in The Fine Art of Mixing Drinks by David A. Embury, published in 1948. So this drink has been around for a while. Um, Embury credits the invention of the drink to an American army captain in Paris during World War I, which he named after the sidecar on his motorcycle. Checks okay, out. I get it. That makes <laughs> sense. It's all coming together. So what the hell is in the drink, right? To start with, you'll need a cognac. We are using Corvassier today. Cognac itself is a variety of brandy that is named after a French commune of Cognac, France. A commune, as we're using it here, is similar to a civil township or an incorporated municipality in the United States. So think less hippie vibes, more just a town, nah, <laughs> basically. Not as fun. I know, right? Someday. Communes without the cults. Right. That's a goal, right? Exactly. <laughs> Crafts and cats and lots of land. Yeah. That's going to be our tagline. Absolutely. <laughs> Done. So the brandy must be distilled twice in copper pot stills and then aged at least two years in French oak barrels from two specific places that I cannot pronounce. One looks like it says limousine and the other one is Tron C with the little thing under it. AIS. Yeah. I'm bad at French. It was not my jam. I took Spanish in high school and that was <laughs> many moons ago. So right, right, right. <laughs> Cognac itself matures in the same way as whiskeys and wines barrel age. Most cognacs spend long, longer times, quote unquote, on the wood than the minimal legal requirement. It just adds depth of flavor. Gotcha. Um, so you'll also need an orange liqueur. Specifically, you want to choose Cointreau, Grand Marnier, or Triple Sec. We're using Cointreau today because we just did our liquor count for the year, and <laughs> I can't wait for you to see the picture. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> because I found stuff I forgot we had. So, hello, Quantro. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome back to us. If it's triple sec, whatever else you've got on hand, use it. Make this drink. It's delish. So, orange flavored liqueur in general, you want a lowish ABV here, usually around 20 to 40 percent. Quantro does fall at the top of that spectrum. It's 40, so whatever. You'll also want fresh squeezed lemon juice if all you have is the stuff in a bottle and you want to join us in the cocktail. Please, Please just use it. Just use it. We're not bougie. It's That's all whatever. I use all the time. Right. It's good in everything. It's good to have on hand. You'll also want to rim your glass in sugar, maybe. And you'll definitely want to garnish it all with an orange twist. As far as glassware goes, we are putting our drink this week into a coupe glass. If you want to use a martini glass, a coffee mug, put it on the rocks, make it slushy, do whatever floats your boat. Mm -hmm. I love it all. Ooh, slushy would be good. I right? <laughs> So to start with, we just chill our glassware in the freezer while we're putting everything together. That way it is nice and frosty by the time we're ready to put the cocktail into it. I highly recommend it because there's nothing like a chilled cocktail in a chilled yes. glass. Yes. It's not only aesthetically pleasing, it just tastes better in my opinion. Agreed. Because it's cold on cold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yum. I support this. <laughs> so once you've assembled all of your ingredients, you've got your glassware in the freezer, grab your trusty shaker tin and fill it up with ice. To your shaker, add one and a half ounces of your cognac. Again, we're using Corvassier. Use whatever you want, whatever floats your boat. Next up, add three quarters of an ounce of the orange liqueur. In our case, it is our Cointreau that we found again. <laughs> and finally, add three quarters of an ounce of fresh squeezed lemon juice. Shake it all up thoroughly till it's nice and frosty. Once that's all done, if you want, rim your glass with sugar. Not necessary. It just elevates your cocktail, in my opinion. Generally speaking, when we do a cocktail that has something on the rim, I have it with the the extra and Suze does not. So it really doesn't take away if you don't want all. it. It just adds another component if you do want it. Yes, absolutely. So take it, leave it. It's all up to you. Whatever makes your heart happy. Once your drink is in the glass, just garnish it all with an orange twist and that is it. I don't know. Tops, my tops right up the street from me had the freshest oranges I've ever seen. So random. When I cut into it, Mark was like, this orange smells fresh. And I was like, <laughs> it actually does. It's the end of January. I know. As we're and recording it tastes this. fresh and it's delicious. So this is a very delicious drink. It's good. I enjoy it. And it, it again, it's a traditional drink. But don't knock the old school shit. Sometimes it's actually delicious. Some of it, I'm like, bleh. You could take the varnish off a table with it. But stuff <laughs> like this, 
It's good. It's well balanced. It is boozy, but not in a bad way. It's not overwhelming though. It's a very balanced is a good word for it. It's a it's a good one. I like it. Winning. So try the sidecar. I'm a fan of citrus (laughs) flavors in cocktails. That too. This is right up my alley. (laughs) Honestly, same Z's. All right, my friends. Now, before we dive right into the nitty gritty here, we're just going to take a brief minute to hear from one of our friends over at the Podmouth Network. Hey, podcast lovers. My name is Haley, and I run the Doe Identify podcast. I have been passionate about helping the unidentified get their names back ever since I found out I lived within miles of where Sherry Ann Jarvis, formerly known as the Walker County Jane Doe, was found. In my podcast, I tell the stories and provide information about unidentified people in hopes of reaching their loved ones and getting their names back. So come join me and help me advocate for these people. You never know, you could recognize someone's story. Okay, everyone, it's time to buckle the fuck up and get ready for the wild ride that is the Barrow Gang. Yeah, it's going to be pretty wild. This is going to be a lot of, this happened on this day, this happened on this day, because There's just a lot we want to get through. They were very busy in their criminal enterprises. Yes. (laughs) So when Clyde was released from prison in February of 1932, he and Ralph Foltz began committing a series of robberies. Their primary targets were gas stations and retail stores. Their mission was to collect enough money and firepower to launch a raid against Eastham Prison. You may recall from last week that Clyde and Ralph were actually locked up there together. During that time, they schemed, they plotted, they dreamed of the day when they could seek retribution against the institution that held them. This went on for a couple of months with little to no issues for the robbers, the robberies that is, until April 19th, when Bonnie and Ralph were captured by the police. They were caught trying to steal firearms from a hardware store. Bonnie was released after a few months in jail. The grand jury was unable to indict her at that time. Because, again, you see a five-foot-tall, wispy little blonde, strawberry Mm -hmm. blonde girl, and you'd be like, there ain't no way she's, like, holding people up for shit. That's our theory. We think that the jury, they likely didn't indict her based on the sole fact that it's incredibly unlikely that women commit violent crimes. Of any sort, Probably any crime. Really, honestly. So that's that's what we're going with. That's our theory. (laughs) She was reunited with Clyde within weeks of her release. Ralph, on the other hand... He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to serve 10 years for that botched robbery. This effectively ended Ralph Fultz's time with the gang. Honestly, I feel like that's better for him. I feel like he (laughs) did not lose out in this. Right. (laughs) So 11 days later, Clyde was the getaway driver for a robbery they were committing in Hillsboro. The target was a local store. According to most sources here, Clyde stayed in the car the whole time. Well, at any rate, nothing here went 100% according to plan. That will be a theme. Yes. Moving forward. (laughs) Somebody shot and killed the store's owner, J.N. Boucher. Boucher? Boucher. I don't know. I listen to Google Talks and I'm like, I don't trust you. (laughs) I want to say Boucher, but I don't think that's it. That's more like you said earlier, like Louisiana kind of vibes. Like Cajun-y. We're not sure exactly. We're not here yet. (laughs) So at any rate, when police arrive on scene, there is a person that has been murdered. The assailants, however, are long gone. An officer showed the victim's wife some photographs, hoping she might be able to pick out the shooter. She sure did hone in on Clyde as number one perpetrator. We don't know for sure if he was the only one picked out of the photographs. I guess it doesn't really matter too much because either way, police weren't able to do Jack Cola with the perpetrators for a long, long time. Long-ish time. Yeah. Long-ish. Feels like forever, but... With all this, probably, <laughs> yeah. On the evening of August 5th, Clyde, his friend Raymond, and another friend of theirs named Ross Dyer were out one night drinking moonshine while attending a country dance in none other than Stringtown, Oklahoma. Again, that sounds made up. It is not. It's not. It's We've a real Googled place. It. It's a real thing. I had to double check because I was like, what? Sometimes my autocorrect gets a little crazy when I get into the <laughs> flow of stuff. But this actually is a town in Oklahoma. I love it. It's, I think it's. it sounds very quaint. I know. It, Especially I with the country there. dance setting. Yeah, right. I just envision a barn. Yes. <laughs> you know? I'm completely making all sorts of assumptions, but... So 
They were approached by a couple of members of law enforcement, Sheriff C.G. Maxwell and Deputy Eugene C. Moore, since, you know, they were just three dudes sitting in a parking lot drinking moonshine in the 1930s. Probably looking very During specific. Prohibition time. And, and I'm sure they were not looking suspicious at all, right? right absolutely not. <laughs> Clyde and Raymond almost immediately opened fire on both officers. Sheriff Maxwell was gravely wounded during this encounter. Deputy Moore, unfortunately, was killed. This incident marked the very first law officer that lost their life to the Barrow Gang. Sadly, not the last. There is a semi-long list. (laughs) A couple months later, on October 11th, 1932, a man named Howard Hall was killed during a robbery. Around 6.25 that evening, three men entered a little corner store. According to one of the store's clerks, the man they identified as Clyde Barrow looked nervous while picking up a few items for purchase. At the register, this clerk looked down, opened the cash drawer to make change, and when he looked back up, Clyde flashed a gun, moved him out of the way, and began to take what was in the till. It was at this point that Howard Hall got involved. He tried yelling at Clyde, telling them he couldn't do that, and he went to grab the man. Infuriated, Clyde backed all of the men into the side entrance and began to physically assault both Hall and the store clerk. At some point, Clyde pulled out a gun and fatally shot Hall three times. Clyde turned and aimed at the store clerk, but the gun, luckily for the clerk, misfired. The robbers, for once, took this as a sign that they needed to just get the hell out of Dodge, and that is just what they did. Now, interestingly enough, many historians and other experts actually disagree on whether this person that shot Howard Hall was in fact Clyde, despite being positively identified by three eyewitnesses. Most people argue that this robbery didn't fit the well-established MO of the Barrow gang, although the other half argues that it totally does. It's a whole thing. So people say that it was obvious that Clyde was planning on taking Howard Hall and the store clerk as hostages, which was very much something he liked to do. He took great joy in it, too. (laughs) That he did. But this situation, as we know, didn't really get that far. So those that argue against Clyde being responsible kind of get hung up on the fact that there were three people in the store, Clyde and two accomplices. And this was unusual and against the M.O. as well. Clyde would often send three people out to commit crimes, usually himself and two others, but he only had two people go into the targeted buildings while the third would wait outside. You know, they had to have a getaway car. Somebody's got to drive and it ain't going to be Clyde in his bare feet. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) So that was something that happened pretty much in every single incident of the Barrow gang and their robberies or whatever happened. So the fact that all three men like went into this store It was incredibly unusual and against what they usually did. Like the Barrow Gang, they were very messy. They were mostly disorganized, but they did have specific things that they stuck to. And this was one of the things that was every single time. Yes, it very much defined kind of the structure, almost, if you will, to what they were doing. It's also notable that Clyde denied any involvement in this incident, which on the surface doesn't seem like it would be weird because, you know, criminals often do that. But yeah, but that's unusual for Clyde. Not Clyde Barrow. He typically acknowledged the crimes he committed, even the murders. So, you know, unfortunately, this incident, we have to classify it as alleged, even though many members of the media and many members of law enforcement are pretty sure that Clyde's responsible. And again... I don't think it's outside the realm of possibilities. Maybe he was testing out a new setup. You know what really does it for me? The fact that they said that Clyde looked nervous. He has never looked. I have never seen him be nervous, though. He I mean, obviously, we weren't there. We don't know. But he just I feel like after all the research we did, everybody made it sound as if he was incredibly confident. Cocky, Cocky, even very, yeah. very sure of himself. He knew what he was doing and he wasn't afraid. He'd been stealing cars since he was a teenager. Yes. Dear Lord. Returning even. So I don't know. What are your thoughts, guys? I would love to know. I think it's a definite. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I definitely think it's possible, but I don't think that it's likely. Oh. I'm on the, I'm on the side of the people that it's like, it's weird that he would what do it. What does it for me is the nervousness. Yeah. What also does it for me is the fact that he was like, I didn't do that. Because 
again, he was very confident. He'd be like, yeah, I totally shot that sheriff. He volunteered information, <laughs> right. according to some sources. Right. So, I mean, you know, what are you going to do with that? I Take don't know. Take that with a grain of salt, guys. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, last week, we discussed Clyde's childhood friend, W.D. Jones, who joined Bonnie and Clyde in their criminal exploits on Christmas Eve, 1932. At the tender age of 16, W.D. left Dallas to join the Barrow Gang. The following day, W.D. accompanied Clyde in search of a stolen car because, again, that's like catnip for Clyde. I <laughs> need a car. Yes. <laughs> I just want to steal it. Even if I have one, I want another one. I want a different one. I want a better one. <laughs> At any rate, they came upon a man named Doyle Johnson, who was just a young family man trying to make his way home from work, literally just living his life yeah. with a car. Just existing as a human inside his right. vehicle. Tragically, he became an unintended victim of their quest for a vehicle and lost his life in the encounter. Some say it was a botched carjacking, yeah. if you will. You know what I mean? Maybe That's... he fought back is my assumption. Not everybody would just be like, here you go. Right. And I think that since there's such a difference in the way that they react to these specific carjackings, I would be inclined to believe that that's what happened. Yeah. Just because there's been other instances, and we'll read about one later, that that was not the end result. It doesn't go like that. <laughs> it does, does not. It's not all the time. So on January 6, 1933, Clyde Barrow killed Tarrant County Deputy Malcolm Davis when W.D. Bonnie and Clyde unintentionally walked into a trap set for another criminal. Again. How do you do that? What the fuck are the chances? How many criminals? Okay. Everybody was poor back then. Right. So, I mean, I, I'm sure there were a lot of criminals. I'm sure a lot of people turned to that lifestyle just to oh, live. Yeah, absolutely. Not judging that necessarily. Not even a little bit, but like we're setting traps for the, and the wrong people are getting ensnared. Like what? Yeah. That, again, it would almost be funny. Well, and I think it's if just it so, wasn't real. It is. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I think it just kind of speaks to this cartoonish way that Clyde and Bonnie and their gang was able to just get themselves into shenanigans and then get themselves out of the shenanigans in the most haphazard of ways. It's it's tragic and it's terrifying, but like, I don't know how lucky they were getting. Well, I mean, it's got to be luck. It's not skill. It definitely was luck. <laughs> and at this point in time, they had committed to a total of five murders in less than a year. That so they were also incredibly unlucky, I think, to an extent. Right. That's a high tally, though, for months. For, yeah. Of robberies for just under around. a year. Yeah. So, do you guys remember Buck, Clyde's brother, <laughs> the one in jail? He got caught with Clyde stealing a truck full of turkeys. Right. <laughs> Again, hilarious. But what? What is happening? <laughs> At any rate, Buck is granted parole in March of 1933, and he was subsequently released from prison. He and his wife, Blanche, immediately join up with Bonnie, Clyde, and W.D. The group sets up a hideout, if you will, on Oak Ridge Drive in Joplin, Missouri. Rumor has it, rumor, heavy on the rumor, <laughs> has it that Buck and Blanche were only visiting with the others and that they wanted to actually try and convince Clyde to turn himself in. It will be a cold day in hell when that happens. Right, right, right. Otherwise, our story would end here and now. Right. <laughs> also that. So this neighborhood that the gangs set themselves up in was quiet and uneventful. This group, however, was the exact opposite. They drank lots of alcohol. They played lots of cards. These card games got really loud. The men would come and go at all hours of the day and night, and they absolutely gave zero fucks about how rambunctious they were while doing all of this. They were so conspicuous, like, whoa. <laughs> One night, Clyde even accidentally fired a Browning automatic rifle inside of the apartment while cleaning the gun. And that is a loud rifle. It is very strong. It shoots bullets very strengthily. Like, <laughs> no, thank you. I would be alarmed. Right. I'm sure they were. And with all this chaos happening, nobody dared go to the home and confront its inhabitants. I certainly wouldn't. But at least there was one brave neighbor that reported all of their suspicions to the local police. Again, if I'm hearing bottles clanking around, people cussing and stuff at all hours of the night, and guns firing. Right. I'd be like, I'm not doing this. No, 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 <laughs> no. You never know what you're going to walk into. You never know what's happening on the other side of that door. Don't do it. If you think somebody's in danger and you feel compelled to do something, call the police. 
That's what their job is there for. Honestly, that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the police acted quickly and they assembled a five-man task force that rolled up to the house in two separate vehicles. So the confrontation took place on April 13th. Initially, police thought that they were breaking up a bootlegging crew because, you know, like we mentioned earlier, prohibition was still very much in play. So this group of law enforcement had no idea that they were about to engage in a shootout with some of America's most wanted. Bootlegging is one thing. Right. Robbers and murderers and car thieves is a whole different. Whole other ball game. It's a whole <laughs> other echelon of criminal. And all three of the gang men opened fire immediately upon seeing the law enforcement outside their door. Detective Harry L. McGinnis and Constable J.W. Harriman were both fatally wounded during the assault. There's so many initials that don't go together in this case that are so clunky to say. So if we sound kind of weird, guys, it's just hard to kind of wrap our mouth around what. Yeah, sometimes I my brain just can't process the letters sometimes. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> so sorry in advance for any further do, fuck ups. Do. <laughs> so Bonnie also opened fire in this instance, but not until everyone was fleeing. Highway Patrol Sergeant G.B. Collar was forced to duck behind a tree for cover. Bonnie was wielding the Browning automatic rifle, that big ass gun. It shot out bullets so powerfully that when they struck the tree that GB was hiding behind, wood splinters actually were forced into his face. Oof. I just envisioned toothpicks, but it would probably be a lot more alarming because there was a bullet like behind all the toothpicks. Of trees yes. Just in your face. Nope. Never in life do I want to be there. No. I'll pass. Guns are scary. If you're going to wield a weapon, do it responsibly, for goodness sakes. Like, learn how to handle it. These people are just like, we... I was going to say, certainly not this. Do do not do it like this. (laughs) None of this. So when the coast became clear enough, the gang jumped into a car and zoomed out of there. They got away mostly unscathed. Um, The officers were only able to fire 14 rounds, which feels like a lot to me and Brie. But honestly, what the fuck do we know? Not a whole lot. There were five officers, well, three at this point. 14 rounds seems like a lot for that many people. But again, (laughs) you tell me. I don't know. I guess it depends. Was it three bullets around? Was it 10 bullets around? I don't know. I don't know enough to speak on it. (laughs) Um, A few officers, however, were able to land some shots on the perpetrators. WD was struck by a bullet on one of his sides. Clyde was struck, but saved by his suit coat button. Again, what kind of magic rabbit or lucky four-leaf clover does he have? Because what are the chances? A suit coat button? Saves weird. you yeah. from a bullet. It sounds like something straight out of the Archer cartoon series. Yes. That's some shit that would happen in there. Right. <laughs> um, and Buck as well was grazed after a bullet ricocheted off of a wall. Again, none of these were life threatening, so they could right. continue on their rampage. When they made their getaway, the gang was forced to abandon most of their possessions. Police searched the house afterwards and found... Buck's three-week-old parole papers. Those little brand new baby, brand spanking Brush new off parole the press. papers, right? With the the ink was the ink even dry? Right. I don't think so. <laughs> they also found a large arsenal of weapons. Not surprising. A handwritten poem, a camera, and several rolls of Ooh. undeveloped film. Film, you say? Now you already know that police needed to know what was on that fucking film, and man, they were not disappointed. I thought it was kind of interesting. Sue's made a note that the police he reached out to the Joplin Globe, which is a daily newspaper that's actually still active today. And they're the ones that helped develop the pictures for law enforcement. Which I don't, because now there's so much secrecy with the media and law enforcement. Back then, it was just like, who's got a dark room? Well, I was going to say, and also, <laughs> who's got the equipment? It's like, not really, ne- you don't really need that. Right. A, a dark room isn't always a requirement for getting this kind of stuff. Now it's digital. Now you're going to find somebody's cell phone and see the pictures. I just really, I I was like, that's so weird that they shared it right off the bat with a newspaper. I think it just, again, is like, it's indicative of the times. Sign of the times. So inter- it's so interesting to me. So they get these pictures developed and what they find were many photos of the gang. Clyde, Bonnie, and WD specifically were found posing with the weapons. They were laughingly pointing them at one another, which is literally the first thing you're told not to do with a loaded weapon. Don't do that, guys. Now, one of the most recognized photos from this entire story was from this collection, and it was one of Bonnie. 
She had a pistol in her hand, a cigar clenched in her teeth, and her foot rested upon a stolen car, and she looked bad as hell. And she had like a hat on. She just looked ready to fuck everything up. If I didn't know what I knew, I would think that she was super badass. This is one of the most famous images that you'll see if you Google Bonnie and Clyde. Again, we're going to post all this fun. Oh, for sure. Joyous stuff later on. It's off-putting to see how happy they were. They were taking joy in it. Those weapons yes. had killed people. And Joyous they were like, we... Is the perfect way to yeah. explain it. Because they did. They just seemed to be living... I think when we were talking about the case earlier, just kind of shooting the shit, you mentioned that like this was their great adventure, yeah. probably. And I think that you can see that in the photos. Because I... If you're undertaking an endeavor such as this, you have to know how it's going to end. Right. To some degree. Right. So I think they were just happy to be where they were, happy to be living in the moment, happy to have each other. Like, yeah, as gross as it is now that we know what we know. Well, if they were just stealing like, I don't know, like bread, essentials yeah, to feed the city or the like, town what? or whatever. Good for you. How Robin about Hood. It, but no, no, that's not what's happening. Here. That's how it started, I think. And then the murder happened. <laughs> Murders. Uh, Interesting. Murdering. Hmm. I know I Clyde's know. goal initially was to get back at East yeah. Them Prison. I think that Bonnie enjoyed the chaos. That's my theory. We'll talk more after that, yeah, yeah, after yeah, we yeah. get through everything. <laughs> All right. So as we mentioned, police did find a handwritten poem. It turns out the author was none other than Bonnie. We're going to read you a couple excerpts, but we will post the poem in its entirety on our social medias. It's actually very well written. Yes. In my humble opinion. I agree. Um, it opens with, you've read the story of Jesse James of how he lived and died. If you're still in need of something to read, here's the story of Bonnie and Clyde. They call them cold-blooded killers. They say they are heartless and mean. But I say this with pride that I once knew Clyde. When he was honest and upright and clean. But the law fooled around, kept taking him down and locking him up in a cell till he said to me, I'll never be free. So I'll meet a few of them in hell. They don't think they're too smart or desperate. They know that the law always wins. They've been shot at before, but they do not ignore that death is the wages of sin. That's kind of deep, too. Well, and I think it speaks to exactly what you said. She was aware of how their story was going to end. Right. I think they all knew that they were living on borrowed time. One way or another, yeah, it had to come to an end. They couldn't sustain a life like this. It was that or jail. Right. I think, again, <laughs> I'll never be free. Right. He knew it. Exactly. So, so I, could take def some I could definitely see Clyde saying that. His whole plan, his whole motive at the very least in the beginning, we know, was revenge on yeah. law enforcement and the government as a whole. Yeah. He was pissed about a situation. And I can't fault that but like what a not the way to go, way about, to go it, about it right <laughs> so author jeff gwynn wrote the book go down together the true untold story of bonnie and clyde in that book he wrote and i quote john dillinger had matinee idol good looks and pretty boy floyd had the best possible nickname but the joplin photos introduced new criminal superstars with the most titillating trademark of all illicit sex Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker were wild and young and undoubtedly slept together, end quote. I just love how they're like, look at them being together and, and having sex. I guarantee, though, people, again, lots of pearl clutching. <laughs> a that, lot of it. Or even like avid interest. There wasn't a whole lot happening at the time. Right. Newspapers and stuff like this was probably one of the, not the highlights, but kind of, sort of, like, Something to talk about, something to read about, something yes. to listen about on the radio. Absolutely. So at any rate, the pictures and poem made front page news across the U.S. of A. And people were very interested. Again, they wanted to read. They wanted to hear. They wanted to see. Give us more. At least at first. The tides started turning eventually. But right. it started out with like, who are these people? Why are they doing this? Like, what's happening? Well, I mean, think about it from like the general American public's point of view. You know, it's a terrible time in history. The Great Depression is bringing everybody like they're cutting them down at the knees. Like everybody is in desperate positions. Every everybody was suffering one way or another. You Absolutely. know what I mean? And then all of a sudden there's this 
these pictures and this poem and it paints a it paints a real pretty picture of what these people may be like like look lawlessness look how beautiful like sh- look at her taking the bull oh by God, the horns they love like each other right yeah it's no. weird it's not as glamorous like everybody wanted to believe that this was some kind of wonderful fairy tale it's, yes. it's not it's violent it's chaotic it's living on the road, not knowing when you're going to eat or sleep safely or, or do any of the things. I couldn't imagine. I don't want to imagine. No, I'm that sounds terrible. I'm quite grateful that I don't have to worry yes, about that. Thank you. Me too. Especially because, you know, Susie's right. After that whole confrontation and everything, the gang had to spend the next three months moving from Texas to as far north as Minnesota. Of course, robbing banks and stealing cars along the way is just what they do. They did a lot of zigzagging around so law enforcement couldn't really catch up to them Mm -hmm. because by the time they had struck one place, they were two states away. Exactly. It was, it's wild. At one point while in Ruston, Louisiana, they kidnapped Dillard Darby and Sophia Stone, two people who were just minding their own business, hanging out in Dillard's car when the Barrow gang came upon them. Now, normally when the gang took hostages, they would release these victims far from home. And sometimes they were even giving money to assist in making it home. Which, uh, what? So you're willing to just shoot people because they said, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> but then you take somebody's car do, and you feel bad enough about it to give them money to get home? I, I don't, it's that duality that yeah. I just, I can't for the life of me figure it out. Well, and I mean, we see it in other cases, you know, there are some truly evil people in the world. Some of them do have that teeny tiny shred of humanity where there's something that tugs at their heartstrings, whether it be like their pet or one specific family member. Right. Just something they treat with like gentleness and reverence. Or or stay away from because, you mm-hmm. know, they don't want to ruin it with their awfulness. Well, and in this case, I just wonder what Clyde's intentions were. Was it a game? Was it a way for him to go, ha ha, you're never going to get us. Look at these people. It might have been like, look, go tell your friends. I'm not as bad as they say I am. I really feel like it's more that than anything. Because I think that, like we said, they were on borrowed time. Who knows? It could have been his way of like trying to add more of that to the table. Maybe. Could be a number of things, honestly. I'm just so curious. I just, it's just little stuff like this that's so intriguing because, mm-hmm. again, this is a violent half cock dude. <laughs> but like yeah. stuff like this, he's like, here's five bucks. I hope you get home safe. Well, here's you know, a good story. You met Clyde Barrow, <laughs> got away with your life. Right. I, you know, when people always ask, like, if you could have anyone to dead or, dead or alive, who would it be? These are the kind of people that I would want to have dinner with just because I want to fucking know. Like so dead. Just tell me what's up. What's your deal, man? (laughs) Why did you do X, Y, Z? What was this like? Right. I just. Just why? Just in general. Why? This is one of the things that fascinates Susan and I the most and kind of why we went in the true crime direction when we started doing this, because the duality of these people that commit these horrific crimes is so fucking fascinating. I just find it so weird. How do you have both of the every human's capable of good and bad? But like, oh, for sure. But to this degree, I just I'm I'm glad my brain can't figure it (laughs) out. But also, I really want to know. Right. I also wish I could figure it out. <laughs> right. Now, this whole taking hostage thing, you know, occurred several times throughout these two years of activity. It's part of the reason why people thought that that questionable robbery was part of Clyde's rap sheet, if you will. Either way, these encounters made headlines. They just added to the romance and the mystique that was kind of building around Bonnie and Clyde. But this didn't last forever. Once the public learned more about their violent escapades, it was becoming known that they would not hesitate to fire on those that got in their way. And this terrified those that lived in the central Midwest. I mean, everyone was scared, really, because they were traveling around a lot. But that was kind of the area they stuck around in most. They had family. They like to go visit their families and stuff. It's just a very bizarre crime spree here. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Like they're predictable, but also not. A so lot that's, of back. yeah, that's why nobody could really keep up with them or yeah. catch up to them, at least initially. Well, and we feel like it's hard for jurisdictions to connect and share information now. Oh, my God. That wasn't then. even 
something that crossed their mind that wasn't probably. even thought of yeah nobody was talking to they one had another their hands full with prohibition and all this other shit like i there was a lot happening well, and again during the depression crime did go up yeah <laughs> because I, I don't know i would steal to feed my family absolutely i wouldn't even fucking and think i'm sure twice. a lot of folks felt the same way you know mm-hmm. what i mean so i can only imagine <laughs> A lot of people don't get into a life of crime because it's what they want. No, for sure. There are definitely people out there like that, but that's not the norm. Right. Most people do it because they are in a desperate situation and they have to. So the release of the photos made getting around for the gang even more difficult, at least on the unnoticed variety. According to an account written by Blanche after the fact, the gang was desperate and discontented at times. They couldn't stay in motels. They couldn't eat in restaurants anymore. They were literally forced to bathe in cold streams and cook whatever they had over a campfire. Again, we talk about romanticizing. Blanche was like, oh, fuck no. It was not like that. No part of that. that. She was like, it was dirty. It was disgusting. I hated it. I barely ate like zero out of 10. Would not recommend. (laughs) So tensions began to build between the five members because, of course, conditions like that. Oh, yeah. Everybody all in one car all the time, never away from each other. I would also be annoyed. That sounds terrible. I mean, remember Star 104 did a whole yes. contest about you it? You sit in the car and you win the car. Yes. Yeah, Whoever no. stayed in the car the longest. Do you remember the one year when they did the sky ride? That the people just rode the sky ride literally all day. They got breaks like every few hours and then they had to stay on the property in waldemere while that happened no yeah that sounds terrible what were it's the early in the late 90s here it was a weird it was was a weird weird time time. (laughs) so at any rate tensions are high everybody's annoyed on june 10th clyde accompanied by wd and bonnie failed to notice warning signs for a construction site near wellington texas The car they were in flipped into a ravine, resulting in severe third-degree burns to Bonnie's right leg. Per WD himself, quote, she'd been burned so bad none of us thought she was going to live. The hide on her right leg was gone from her hip down to her ankle. I could see the bone at places. Oh, no, never. They said it was either battery acid or actual fire. Nobody really knows. I wasn't there. (laughs) WD was there, but all he saw was the aftermath. Because again, if you're in a car that's flipping over. Well, and those things happen so fast. Well, yeah. It just like a snap of your fingers. Also, my mom actually recalls a time when cars didn't have seatbelts. Oh. And that was after this time. So you're in a steel brick. With nothing to hold you down. <laughs> that's yeah. May that's the odds actually be ever really, in your favor. That's a really good point. <laughs> Terrifying. So following this incident, Bonnie faced difficulty walking and had to resort to actually hopping on one leg or being carried by Clyde. Like again, this would be comical if it wasn't tragic. It sounds like a movie script. Right. But this it is real life. Ma- it sounds made up, but this is an actual thing. <laughs> After Bonnie got hurt, W.D., Clyde, and Bonnie herself managed to kidnap Sheriff George Corey and Marshal Paul Hardy, leaving them handcuffed and barbed wire to a tree in Eric, Oklahoma. Later, they met back up with Buck and Blanche, attempting to hide in a tourist camp near Fort Smith, Arkansas, so they could tend to Bonnie's very serious wounds. Fun fact, tourist camps and courts were actually a common form of lodging for travelers in the U.S. from the 1930s to like the mid 60s. The terms were used to describe both an individual cabin or room rented for the night and also the business as a whole. It just I had to Google it because I was like, what the hell is this? Yeah, I just thought of like campsites, but it's not necessarily that. It's a little bit more permanent. (laughs) Right. (laughs) However. The gang had to flee after a failed robbery happened in Alma, Arkansas, where town marshal Henry D. Humphrey was killed due to mistakes made by Buck and W.D. A lot of mistakes. But again, there's the mistakes and then the sheer luck that they have. That they get of escaping every single time. getting out of all of this is just bananas to me. It's, I honestly am shocked that they survived the car flip. I mean, if you can see my bone in my leg, I'm not fucking going anywhere (laughs) other than the hospital. Right. Help me, somebody. Give me medicine. Make this better. Or at that point, like, just put me out of my misery. Yeah. I'd call it quits at the very least, but they're like, no, it's fine. Hop, 
Hop on over here, Bonnie. We gotta go. Get in I'll the car. Carry, I'll carry you to the stolen vehicle. I'll carry you with my missing two toes. Again. Oh my god. <laughs> what it, a fucking mess. <laughs> it 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 sounds so tragic, and yet they're getting away with these crimes. Yes. They're murdering people. They're getting away from law enforcement time and time again. It's just you couldn't write a script. Right. Like honestly, this. This really, shit just writes itself. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, in July of 1933, the notorious Barrow Gang checked into the Red Crown Tourist Court just south of Platt City, Missouri. The court consisted of two brick cabins joined in the middle by garages, both of which were rented by the gang. When Blanche rented the rooms, she only did so for three people, but the owner, Neil Hauser, who was not blind, <laughs> observed five people getting out of the car. He also noted that the driver backed the car into the garage, quote unquote, gangster style. This was called so because it was common practice for criminals like this, since they had the need for a quick getaway. So you want your front end pointed out. Right. Don't want to have quick. to back up and try to like right. figure it out. Maneuver. Yeah. <laughs> no three point turns over there. <laughs> right. The payment for the room and the five meals she ordered was made in coins and Blanche, who was wearing Jodhapur riding breeches raised Neil's suspicions even further. The riding pants were notable. They were unusual, too. Eyewitnesses e remembered them even years later. Not only did ladies not wear pants, they did not wear riding breeches. Right. They're a very specific type of pant. Yes. There's a very famous picture of Blanche. She's wearing those. Yes. You will know what I mean when we show you. Don't worry, <laughs> we got you. Because I had to Google it. I was like, what? What are yeah. riding breeches? I know, me too. Turns out they're a specific type of pant. I knew what it was. I was happy to know that I had the right connection, but I was still unsure. Like what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the next day, the owner noticed that there were newspapers covering the windows of the cabins. And then later, Blanche went ahead and ordered five more dinners. So don't be suspicious at all. Again, they're just so conspicuous. It's They don't... It's like they're not even trying. It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there was a sense of this, like, being untouchable kind of thing going on, even after all of the things that have happened so far. I feel like, yes, because there's technically they're still getting away alive. Right. <laughs> Not all in one piece, but they're getting away. Exactly. Every time. So the gang's activities attracted the attention of Captain William Baxter of the Highway Patrol one evening while he was visiting the Red Crown Tavern. This was a popular restaurant among highway patrolmen and was conveniently located just south of the, to the tourist court. I literally laughed. I was like, of all the gin joints in this town, you had to pick this one. Right. You know what I mean? There was regularly like law enforcement just like do to do. Almost like it was daily. All hours of lunch the day. And, dinner. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, you know, we're all aware by this point that lying low is not exactly the gang's strong suit. So it's not really surprising that Baxter picked up on something strange going on. And then the owner of the court, Hauser, shared his suspicions with Captain Baxter, leading to further investigation. One day, Clyde and W.D. went into town to purchase supplies, including crackers, cheese, bandages, and so some atropine sulfate. The last two things would aid in Bonnie's injuries. Local police had already been made aware that there were wanted individuals seeking these specific supplies, and local PD then alerted the drugstores. So when Clyde and WD made these purchases, the pharmacist alerted Sheriff Holt Coffee right away. The cabins were immediately put under surveillance, and you know it's kind of a a comical twist of events here. The newspaper on the windows made it really easy for law enforcement to move about and make a plan without being seen by the gang. I literally was like, wait, they thought they were protecting themselves. Like, but it turns on out, the desk, like, what the fuck? <laughs> turns <laughs> out they just made it worse. They just, yeah. Uh, so at any rate, Sheriff Coffey called in reinforcements from Kansas City. That included an armored car. This whole entourage approached the cabins around 1 a.m. on July 20th, 1933, armed with Thompson submachine guns, the fuck around and find out type of weapons. <laughs> Sheriff Coffey knocked on one cabin door, announcing himself as law enforcement. Blanche said, just a minute, which turned out to be a prearranged code that alerted Clyde, who then went into the garage and saw the officers through a glass panel in the door. He immediately started shooting at the police because if we know one thing about Clyde, shoot, shoot first, first, questions later. 
maybe ask no questions. Just, Just get shoot. out. Yep. Shoot, shoot and leave. Steal a car and drive away. <laughs> So in the exchange of gunfire here, Sheriff Coffey was wounded and Buck sustained a very severe head injury. He and Blanche had to leave their cabin via the front door and directly face the police's gunfire. Unlike Bonnie and Clyde, their cabin conveniently had a door that connected to the garage so they could sort of get into the car and go from there. Right. Needing a way out. Clyde fired two rounds at the armored police car that was parked across the garage doors, so it was effectively trying to block the gang's cars that were inside the garage. Basically, it was blocking the doors, is how I read it. Preventing them from being able to leave easily. An armored car is supposed to be pretty serious, right? You would think. Turns out it's not, because the bullets penetrated said armored armored car. car. And the officer behind the wheel was wounded, so he was forced to back away from the door, which then opened up an escape route for the gang's car. Again, the sheer luck that is going on here, I just can't imagine. Well, and then in the fray of it all, Bonnie and Clyde stopped to help Blanche pull Buck into their car, still under fire, which... Is just crazy to me. Just think, trying to like put myself in that kind of scenario. When like, they say I can only imagine. Hail of gunfire, this is what I think of. Yes. Except it's a submachine gun, so it is not really a hail, it's just a direct yeah. assault. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about Buck, he was not in very great shape. He received a through and through wound to his left temple. The bullet traveled through the inner surface of the front portion of his skull and exited from his right temple. The gang was able to get away, but yet again, under a hail of gunfire, they were not letting up in any way, shape or form. And this shattered, (laughs) right. And this shattered the car windows, which permanently blinded Blanche in her left eye and damaged her vision in her right one. The gang was not only able to get away, but they were also able to steal another vehicle, one without bullet holes. You know, and with a windshield and glass and stuff. Right. And this was possible because a bullet had short-circuited the horn on the armored car, which caused it to honk incessantly. And this, you guys, this led officers to believe that there was a that it was a signal for a ceasefire. So as the gang got the fuck out of there, no one tried to stop them or give chase. Again, you guys. What are the fucking chances? What in the world? (laughs) What kind out of all of the bullets in this whole entire barrage that's occurring here, one just luckily short circuited something? That's crazy. It didn't sever it. It didn't make it inoperable. It just turned it on. Right. Which just happened to be the ceasefire. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Again, you can't write this shit. Right. I could not make this up this even if I tried. This is real, 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 real. So a few days later, the Barrel Gang sought refuge in the eerie silence of Dexfield Park, which was an abandoned amusement park near Dexter, Iowa. Buck was in very critical condition due to his severe head injury. Clyde and WD, recognizing Buck's deteriorating state, took the drastic step step of actually digging a grave for him. Like, y'all, he was really not doing well. He was not barely talking. He was not eating. He was only semi-conscious most of the time. Apparently, soon after their arrival, some residents discovered some bloody bandages and tipped off law enforcement. Local police and around 100 spectators surrounded the gang triggering yet another awful confrontation. (laughs) Despite the odds, Bonnie, Clyde, and W.D. managed to escape on foot. Allegedly, W.D. carried Bonnie, while Clyde, wounded in the arm, followed them. They sought refuge in some thick brush that the officers hesitated to enter, which then allowed the trio to cross the river and, da-da-da, steal a car for the getaway. (laughs) During the chaos, Buck got shot in the back while engaging in a firefight, if you will, with police. Blanche got shot in the abdomen with some shotgun pellets, but stayed behind to help her husband. Both were captured and arrested by law enforcement before getting taken to the hospital. On the way, Buck was asked where he was wanted by the law. And in an act of defiance and... I have to give it to him some badassery. I literally was like, fuck, yes. (laughs) His reply was, everywhere I've been. Which is so fucking accurate. (laughs) The the fucking balls on this dude. The man's brain was literally protruding from his wound, and he still managed to give some sass. I (laughs) am shocked that he could even 
comprehend what was being asked of him yes. and then respond with attitude. Right. Yes, exactly. There's that. not many parts of the story that I'm proud of, but this one I was like, you go. You go, Buck. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. I guess it depends on how you look at it. Buck later succumbed to his injuries about five days after enduring emergency surgery. I feel like in these situations, it's unfortunate when they can't pay for their crimes. I guess it just depends on how you feel about such things. He and Blanche were just visiting them, trying to get Clyde to turn himself. Just trying to help, and they just got caught up in some weird shit. I hate it when that happens. After his death for the following six weeks, the remaining gang members roamed far beyond their usual territory, committing armed robberies as they traveled west to Colorado, north to Minnesota, and southeast to Mississippi. Again, there might not have been rhyme or reason, but at least they kept everybody guessing. I haven't been able to find an image like already made, but I think I might we might put like post an image of the country just so you guys I know that we have a decent amount of listeners that are not from here. Yeah. Just to give you an idea of what the, we're talking about yeah how like much, the scope of it because yes, it, it really how far is they traveled and things like that it's a lot with not only are they very recognizable for very violent things that they've done yeah they're stealing cars left and right and they're still managing to like circumvent law enforcement this mm-hmm. whole entire time it's it's really wild it would yeah. be almost impressive if they weren't violent and weren't killing awful. everybody yeah <laughs> So Clyde and WD at this point further augment their arsenal by robbing an armory in Illinois. They acquire three more of the BARs. They also pick up some handguns and a butt ton of ammunition. In early September, the gang risked a visit to Dallas to see their families after four months of being on the run. Here is where WD parted ways with them. He headed up to Houston, where he was later arrested without incident in November of 1933. When confronted by the police, W.D. blamed everything on Bonnie, Clyde, and Buck. He said that they were the ones who did all the shooting and robbing and that he, just a minor, innocent child, was an unwilling member of the gang who was forced to ride with them at gunpoint. W.D. claimed to be unconscious due to fear or trauma most of the time and was chained to trees and car bumpers each night so he couldn't escape. It's possible that this was an agreed upon story that Clyde gave WD his blessings to blame all that serious shit on him, on people that had nothing to lose. But again, who knows? I, I think he sort of liked it. Oh, WD. Yes. I don't really think any of that's true. Oh, yeah. No, none of that. But I think it was a way to like pass the buck on somebody who c- couldn't be held responsible for any of it, you know? So. I think that with all of the people who had come into contact with them, and live to tell the story i think there would have been at least one account where because wd was involved in some of that i think there would have been at least one account where they'd been like yeah this teenager is just like being dragged with them kind yeah. of thing. you know what i mean no nobody gave much, up that info <laughs> with as much coverage as there was even at the time oh for sure i just i feel like it's unlikely mm. After WD's departure, Clyde continued his criminal activities with local small-time accomplices while the couple's family helped take care of Bonnie. On November 22nd, Bonnie and Clyde narrowly evaded arrest during an ambush by Dallas Sheriff Smoot Schmidt. That Say that five <laughs> times fast. Dallas Sheriff Smoot Schmidt. Nope, I can't do it. Sheriff Schmidt and his deputies, which ironically included a man named Deputy Ted Hinton, who was a regular from the restaurant that Bonnie worked at prior to meeting Clyde. Bum, bum, bum. The couple was planning to meet with family members near Sowers, Texas. As they were approaching the designated spot, Clyde sensed that something was up, so he just decided to drive past his family, who were waiting either next to or in their own vehicle. At that point, the officers stood up and opened fire. The family members were in the crossfire, but thankfully none were hit. Bonnie and Clyde were able to make their escape, but not before getting hit with a BAR bullet. And it, guys, it went through the car and struck both of them in the legs, like right in the kneecaps. So not only <laughs> Clyde has, he's missing two toes. Bonnie's missing half of the skin on one of her legs. Now they've both been shot in the kneecaps. Right. At what point are you like, I'm going to wave the white flag? They did. They don't. Never. Never. Is the For answer these there. Two, never. <laughs> so on November 28th, 1933, a Dallas grand jury issued a murder indictment against both Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow for the killing of Tarrant County Deputy Malcolm Davis nearly 10 months earlier. 
This was Bonnie's first warrant for murder. The relentless pursuit and criminal exploits of the Barrow Gang continued, leaving a trail of chaos and notoriety across the American landscape. And with that, my friends, we'll conclude our journey for today. Ooh, cliffhanger. In our next episode, we'll delve into the final chapters of Bonnie and Clyde's tumultuous lives. We'll explore the daring prison break they successfully executed, examine the decisive actions taken by law enforcement to put an end to their criminal spree, and of course, reflect on the societal impact of this infamous killer couple and their extraordinary escapades. It's a wild ride. Again, it would be (laughs) amazing if it wasn't so violent and so awful. Yeah. And what I'm excited to talk about the most, honestly, is kind of the aftermath of it all, because I think it's so fascinating how society has completely warped this narrative. Well, because again, and I know we'll discuss it, they made a fucking movie about this. Yeah. And it's like Robert Redford, <laughs> like beautiful, wonderful, we're bathing mm-hmm. in the streams, and it's so <laughs> sensuous. So it was romantic. Literally, Blanche was like, no. It was terrible. There was no part of that that was like, ah, oh, yes, how refreshing. <laughs> yes and with that we are going to thank you yes. for coming to hang out with us Ooh. we're going to save some more of this vibe for next week i just again i just next I week is when hilarious. i'm gonna get all up in arms yep. <laughs> <laughs> so in the meantime be sure you're following the podcast on social media so we can all hang out have a good time on facebook and instagram we're at crime and spirits pod that is the word and on tiktok we're at crime and spirits podcast this is where you can find ingredients recipes fun videos random memes just a whole bunch of stuff and if you'd like to follow us personally you can find us both on instagram i'm at Suze, not susan and i'm at brie b-r-e-e underscore not the cheese if you like what you just listened to which i really hope that you do i do i do pretty please leave us a rating and or a review apple podcast is really kind of the big one in the game right now but we appreciate any feedback on any platform you have available absolutely uh it really makes our day and it does help us kind of show up a little bit more in search engines and just helps us get out there a little bit more if you would like to recommend a case or cocktail for us to check out please email us at crime and spirits podcast at gmail.com or really anywhere if you want to dm us because that's easier on instagram facebook whatever that's also fine and again no matter which route you choose you're getting one of us one of us for sure so directly just do it what you yes. got? You got a liquor? You got a drink? You got a case? You know something? I'm super excited because we do have one of our newer fans, which I'm super stoked to uh, get into this. She Absolutely. recommended a really interesting case that's kind of local-ish that to us. I have never heard of. Yeah, so. so please, please definitely, if you guys have anything at all, even just a topic, sh- let us know. And finally, if you're interested in becoming a monthly supporter of our podcast, you know there is a link for that in the show notes. Feel free to smash that link. All right, my friends. Time to shake off the heebie-jeebies before we get going. Yes. With a corny joke. Are you ready? I am. Have you ever tried eating a clock? It's really time-consuming, especially if you go for seconds. (laughs) Oh, no. That's a good one, (laughs) now. But it took a, it took me a hot minute today to find a joke. I was getting I like real that frustrated. One. Okay, that's I'm glad. funny. <laughs> that's a good one. Good, good, good. All right, my friends. Thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out. We appreciate you. We appreciate the time you give to us each and every time. It just means the world to us. Absolutely. Stay safe. Stay home. Drink a glass of water. And be kind to one person today. Just yep. one extra person. Honestly, <laughs> we love you, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.